All right, super nerds. So today we're going to look at DNA analysis. And if some of this seems though it's it's more complicated than we're talking about, this one lesson at a university level would essentially be most of a course, if not a whole course, on how to do this one technique. And it's super interesting, and well, you're going to enjoy it, I hope. So basically, what you should be able to do is explain why we can use DNA to identify an individual. Um, also, relationships between people, which is where we will get to this guy in class. So, here's a little primer on what genes and DNA are. Genes and DNA are. Uh, we'll do this very quickly, and this is particularly important for the non-bio people. So, DNA is found in the nucleus of the cell, um, base sequence, so the, the, the pairing, you know, the A's and the T's and the G's and C's, that's the genetic code, and it is the exons here, okay? So the exons there, that's the genetic code. And that's all very cool, the biologists love that crap. We don't, that's not what we're into. We are into this stuff here, the introns. Uh, but we'll get to that in a second. So genetic information, it's, you know, determines how the cell works. It's essentially the set of instructions for you as an organism. Um, these control the primary structure of proteins produced, and that is what does all the stuff in the organism. That's proteins. That's where they come from. That's their job. Their job is everything. Um, and the, the genetic code, it's organized, or it's determined by the sequence of base pairs. Okay, cool. So, no, that's super, super interesting. We all should know most of that. Um, this is what a gene looks like. Okay. Um, you have... It gets turned into RNA, a bit beyond us, don't stress. It goes exon, exon, exon. The introns are taken out, and then you have this thing called messenger RNA, which is then translated, and it makes your protein. Okay, so there's a couple of steps. It doesn't just go DNA, protein. Um, again, we're going to focus on these guys. They're the ones for us. So... Basically, you have 46 chromosomes, 23 from mum, 23 from dad. We are all, you know, very closely related as, a, as an organism. We are 99.99, actually we'll go with one, 99.9% .9 identical. And there is this 0.1% difference that accounts for all of the variation. Um, most of the difference occurs in what we call junk DNA or non coding DNA. In other words, the introns. This, as forensic chemists, that's what we care about. We're not worried about the bits which make, give you blue eyes and brown hair and whatever. We're interested in the introns. Now, the closer you are, the more identical your introns will be. For example, your sister, your dad, your mum, your brothers, whatever, those people will all have roughly 50% the same introns as you, okay? Roughly 50% the same. People are a little further back, further apart, the introns get fewer and fewer and fewer. The only exception is the identical twins which have exactly the same DNA as each other. Now, just one more thing with those introns, they are highly variable. Now, genes don't change that much because if they do, you die. So genes tend to stay fairly stable. But the intron part of those genes, because they get taken out, and they're there for, they're there for regulation um, mostly, because they get taken out, they can be as varied as they want, and you don't die. And that's pretty cool. Um, all right, so introns tend to be these things called short tandem repeats. Know that word. So STRs, they are at specific loci. Loci is genetic speak for location. Um, so at specific loci, the intro, the introns, um, there's it's actually two to six. Um, so you, you'll have two to six base pairs, which are just repeated over and over and over. For example, here is some victim's DNA and some DNA from a crime scene, and this is our suspect. Of GT, these, this victim has 24 repeats of GT, 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 GT. 
16 repeats and this section would go something like ATGG, ATGG, ATGG and another 13 more times. This one here would go ATT, ATT, ATT and another 63 times. And here we have the suspect's DNA which is 49, 16, 51. That is different. Okay, see how we're using more than one um, section. If these at this low si here, at that low, oh, that's a locus, it doesn't matter. At this spot here, you have the same. We couldn't tell them. So because we use multiple sections, we're able to differentiate between those two people. And by using just these three sections, we can see that this is the same person. If we used more sections, um, we could be more confident. So more sets of short tandem repeats, we could be more confident about this match right here. Okay, um, the combination of the, of the entire set of STRs in a genome is individual, 100%, uh, to the point where even, um, depending on where you grab the cell from, you might even have a bit of variation amongst um, identical twins. Um, so the more repeats we use, the more useful it is, and the less likely we'll have a false positive. Um, but again, just want to point out that STRs are non coding regions. So this means they're not selected against and that's why they have a very high variability. All right, so let's have a quick look at DNA profiling. Now, well, it's not going to be quick. That's the rest of the video is DNA profiling. Profiling. So it's DNA fingerprinting, testing, typing. Um, we use it to basically identify an individual. So here is the very quick process which we're about to go through. You get a sample, you take the DNA out of it, we then do something called PCR, which is not in this step here. You cut the DNA into fragments. The fragments are separated by electrophoresis. And then we look at all this here as one step, which is essentially you tag them with some radioactive DNA or DNA that fluoresces. You then um, blot it onto a piece of paper or nylon. Um, and then you put that on X-ray film and because this is radioactive, it will give you an image once the film is developed. There are three types of results from any forensics test. There are inclusions, which means this person is included into the scene of the crime. There are exclusions, as in there is no, or non-inclusion is another way to think of this. This person's profile does not match DNA from the scene of the crime. And then more often than we'd like, there are inconclusive results, which means the results are contaminated, so we can't tell. Or there wasn't enough, so we can't tell. And we'll see how much we need in a minute. And then you get something like this. So here's me without my glasses. Um, and here's our suspect B. Um, you see that this one here is the crime scene evidence. And we go uh, 12 repeats, 16 repeats. This person at this low site, these two low site only has 12 repeats. So you see that it's the same length there. Um, so they, they, it goes one, two, one, two, one, two, um, and it's also at 12, 16. Now, this is just one loci, and you'll notice that each one here has two sets. And the reason it has two sets is because you get one chromosome from mum, one chromosome from dad. And see, it wasn't me, it was the other guy. Um, so let's start off with the process, and we'll go through it step by step. All right, so I just had a quick check of the time. Uh, we're eight and a half minutes in. If you wish to have a break, now is the time. Go get a drink, um, go for a little strut, and then come back. All right, so collection and fragmentation. So the first thing we have to do is we have to collect DNA, okay? And we're talking forensic stuff, so it's always a bit dark. So it could be tissue, blood, semen, saliva, or ham, ham samples, hair samples at the crime scene. Um, remember, we, we must establish a chain of custody to prevent contamination. Um, the, the samples are then purified. Again, that is a one sentence step, but it is a many, many, many step sentence. Um, so samples are purified uh, to remove all the contaminations. And then we add something called restriction enzymes. Uh, restriction enzymes or endonucleases, which we're happy with this term here. Restriction enzymes, they're used to cut 
the very, very long DNA strand, and the, is represented by scissors here, very cleverly, um, into the STRs. So essentially it cuts out the short tandem repeats. It just cuts it, cuts it, cuts it, cuts it. Now, they are made at loci where tandem repeats of section, tandem repeated sections of DNA occur. In other words, we use specific, specific restriction enzymes that attack certain STRs, okay? And that's on purpose. Um, and we use 10 different segments in Australia, okay? That's heaps, that, that's a lot, which means you should get roughly 20 bands. Okay, so we've cut it up into all tiny little bits here. Generally with forensics, we'll have to do something called DNA amplification. And this is what was the real game changer when we talked about someone such as um, uh, Gary Ridgway. The real game changer was PCR, which is what we're talking about now. So polymerase chain reaction is essentially we use it to copy, to make many, many, many copies of DNA segments. So for example, you think of amplifying, you think of a sound wave which has gone from this to this. Now you'll see that the, well, of course this goes drawn by hand, but ideally that those distances don't change. The only thing that changes is the amount of energy in that wave. That's what's happening here. So, or the amount of power output of that wave. Um, so we use an enzyme called TAC DNA polymerase. And we use that to replicate it. Now it works like this. You heat it to about 95 degrees. And the reason you do this is it breaks the hydrogen bonds between it. Remember between the nitrogenous bases. And this separates it into two separate sections. Don't worry about these guys yet. They're coming. You then cool it to about 60 to 50 degrees. And you attach a pair of markers called primers. Now a primer is different to a primer. But that's cool. You attach it to a primer, and this process is called annealing. Um, you attach it to the primer, and this gives the polymerase, so the TAC DNA polymerase, something to bind to. So this joins at the start of the tandem repeat. Okay, so it joins right at the start, bang, all good there. So these primer sequences will match the tandem repeats. Um, one primer in each pair has a fluorescent tag, and this emits a different color, or it can emit a different wavelength of radiation, which is what colors are, but it, it emits something that allows us to identify it. The one we're going to worry about is color. Um, again, we use 10 different primer pairs. This goes for our 10 different restriction enzymes, so you see how it matches up. Um, you then heat it back up to 75 degrees, and that's when the TAC polymerase starts working, and it extends it. it. You've got, so in this test tube here, you also have a bunch of nucleotides, and it just, it starts adding nu complementary nucleotides, and it just makes it longer and longer and longer. All right? Once it's done, it's duplicated the strand of DNA. So you've got an exact copy of this section, an exact copy of that section, which both are the same as this and that's pretty rad that's pcr it is that simple however however so each time you do it you double your sample um it so after one you've now got two versions of this dna after two you've got four eight sixteen and so forth and you do this 30 30 to 40 times and you've got upwards of i want to say billions um so then the two forms recombine and they form double helixes and we do it about 30 to 40 times. 30 to 40, right? 30 to 40, not number of strands. Oh, sorry. Step 35, 30 to 40 times. Now, this is why it's so useful. We used to need this much evidence, okay? And by the way, after a while, you know, if, the, if the, the body's not found straight away, most of this will be useless, but there will be small sections in there that are. Yet with PCR, this drop the size of a pinhead, that's enough for us. Um, now, let's have a quick look at gel electrophoresis. This is our last slide, so hang in there. This is where we make a DNA profile. 
is gel electrophoresis. So the DNA fragments, we've created them. They're now separated using a polyacrylamide gel. Um, DNA tends to have a negative charge. So it gets put in the wells. It'll start all up here. And because it's got a negative charge, the positive terminal is down the bottom here. So this is the positive terminal. That's the negative terminal. And it will start moving down. Um, fragments of less tandem repeats go faster, so they move further down. Um, these ones that I said are called ladders. These are known lengths. Okay, So they are known lengths, which means you know that that one's one size, this one's one size, and all you know the distance, you know the sizes in base pairs of all of these, and you can identify it that way. Okay, you can work out roughly how big they are. Now, again, less ones move further down. Um, so essentially, we this is our standard one here, and we know the distance, so we can say if this one here is, we'll say 15 base pairs long, 16 base pairs long. Actually, it's probably close to 160 base pairs long. Um, anything along there is about 160 base pairs long. You've also got these controls, and the controls are there as a backup for the ladders. Remember, it is really, really important to us that we get more than an extremely conclusive result. We really don't want false positives. So... This gives us our DNA profile, and that's about as complex as it is. Um, we essentially we can differentiate it using UV light, so you've got the colors on there, you then hit it with UV light, and it becomes visible. Um, the fluorescent tags emit their color, and a detector identifies each band by the color it emits. So you, you do this with um, computers, and it gets you a colored image, or... This one here is done slightly different. This one here, so you get different colored images. This one here is done by, these are the ones where the bands are radioactive and a film, an x-ray film is put over top of it. And then we get we develop the film and we get an image like this. So each locus on the DNA, it'll produce two bands because there are two fragments, one from the chromosome of each parent. So in this case here, we're looking at one locus in particular. So here, uh, we've got it here and right down the bottom, okay? Um, and that's the victim. The sperm, which was taken from the evidence, okay? So you'll see that the uh, female cell here matches the victim. Perfect, not a drama. Um, this one here matches suspect one. This one here matches suspect one. Suspect 2 matches neither, so suspect 1 is a, an inclusion, suspect 2 is an exclusion. Now you can also use it to test paternity, um, for example, because we can't really, that one's not super clear, if this is a paternity case, um, you would have, so we'll say that this one here is mum, or, or dad, this one here is mum, um, you would have and we'll pretend this one here is the child, ignore that one altogether. What you end up with is one there that matches mum and one there that matches dad. And that's pretty much where we're at. All right, that was a lot. Hang in there. See you in class. We'll get back to the creepy real soon.